I am so glad that you decided to come on the podcast and talk with me today. You're a brave girl speaking your story and speaking your truth. And I really appreciate that. So thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, I want to start right at the beginning of your story, just so people have a general idea of what it was like for you prior to this mentally abusive relationship. Um, so we just have a little bit of a background there. So can you tell me a little bit about that leading up to when you met your now ex-husband? Yeah, sure. Um, so my childhood, it wasn't perfect, obviously. Um, I think a lot of people in this situation kind of have the same thing going on. Um, I, my dad was an alcoholic and he started being abusive when I was around four and he mostly abused my brother who in turn abused me. So I had a lot of abuse, a lot of psychological abuse from my brother. It was really bad, you know, knives in my face, stuff like that. Very terrifying things. Um, so, and I, and I met my ex when I was 19, you know, and my brother did this stuff to me until I was about 17. So I didn't really have much time to heal. You know, I didn't even know healing was a thing. (laughs) I didn't know it was an option. You know, my ex came from a very good Catholic home, you know, with lots of money. And I came from a very broken, poor background with a lot of trauma. So here comes my prince, (laughs) you know? Uh, Right. Yeah. So, uh, and I mean, my, my mom was in the picture, but she you know, I was thinking about this the other day. She, I only remember my mom saying, I love you one time in my entire adolescence. And that was when there was a tornado warning and she was at work. So I definitely didn't have that affection as well, you know, that I right. craved. So then cue the ex. He, he was very affectionate in the beginning. <laughs> so That's, that's interesting. I wonder um, how common that is because you hear stories a lot about people that have that narcissist personality or are mentally abusive people. They tend to be able to easily spot somebody that seems in a position where they're very vulnerable. And it's interesting. I don't even know if they know they do that sometimes in Mm -hmm. some circumstances. Right. But like you were so easy to see the good in him Yeah, because you needed that. Yeah at that time. Right. So it's so easy to just focus on that part of things. Right. Yeah. And oh, it's, yeah. it's not a bad thing to look for things that were missing in your life, but it's important to remember we had to find those things within ourselves, not from other people. Yeah, exactly. Right. Mm-hmm. And when you look for it in other people, you can end up in a pretty bad situation, which mm-hmm. is what we're going to talk about. Yes. So first, I mean, like, obviously we're talking about a mentally abusive relationship and narcissism. I want to know though, while we're in this, like, how did we meet phase? What did the, um, during all of this, like he loves me and he's staring at me and all of this were there now that you're in a different place. Do you look back at that time and see any like red flags that you didn't see at the time because of the mindset you were in? Well, of course, you know, in hindsight, everything's a red flag now, but I'm like, oh, we fell in love to the Coldplay album. I'm like, no, I fell in love to that album and you were just watching me and like mirroring me. That's what was happening. I make, I make everything a red flag now, to be honest with you. But uh, there were, I had the first few months, it seemed pretty genuine. You know, still to this day, after everything I know, the first few months seemed genuine. And then there were some times probably between three and seven months where I would be loud. You know, I would be like excited and really happy about something. And he would motion his hands down to the ground to tell me that I was being too loud. And that, that hurt, like, because I was just being happy, you know, I was just having a good time and I was just being myself and it was too much. So me being myself was too much. Why? I don't know. Um, And then, sorry, that, that one, that was a tough one. You got to worry about those people that hear that enough and they turn their volume down. You found yours again. I did. You did. And that's awesome. (laughs) And like, that's what we hope comes out of this is other people find their volume again too. Yes, they will. 
absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he uh, he he tried to suppress these these parts of me that actually made me me. You know, these they were good. They were good parts of me, and I was the funny girl. Like I was the shy, you know, modest girl and everything. But I was I was the funny girl, and uh, he always laughed. Like he always laughed when he was around me. And then one time, I said something that was really funny. I don't, of course, I don't remember what. But he looked at me and he said, you know you don't have to try so hard all the time. You don't have to try to be funny. So I stopped being funny. <laughs> I mean, I was still, I was still funny, but it wasn't, I just felt like everything, like I was just trying too hard. You know, I felt insecure about being myself. And the, the astrology uh, intuitive kind of thing, you know, I told you I was kind of like into reading horoscopes, just, just silly stuff. I wasn't even sure if I entirely believed it, but I enjoyed it. Yeah. And, um, and intuition too, you know, I would have these like random thoughts come into my head or of a person I haven't seen in years. And all of a sudden they would walk by me in the store. It was very weird, like energy kind of stuff. And if I mentioned that to him, he would roll his eyes, like straight up roll his eyes. And like, you know, that's devil stuff. Like we, that's not real. That stuff's not real. Like, so so I got to feel ashamed of myself for having any kind of intuitive feelings and thoughts. So that part of me was suppressed for many years. Oh, but, uh, and then I got pregnant at seven months into the relationship. So, and then that was it. Were you guys living together? No, I was living, I was living with my best friend and his mom at that time when I was pregnant. Yeah. So, so you're pregnant and did things start to escalate? Did you start to notice things at this point through the pregnancy or did things stay pretty good through the whole pregnancy? There, I mean, he was like comforting and reassuring. I was very sick a lot. Um, he took care of me there, but it was just more of that, you know, if I'm, I'm being too obnoxious, I'm being too loud. Um, I remember, obviously this was before I got pregnant we were at the store and I said, Hey, we have to go get condoms. We have to go pick up condoms. And the look on his face, it was like sheer terror. Like he looked around him, like his grandmother was going to be like in the next aisle. And he was like, shh, shh, you know, don't, don't talk like that. I was like, what? Like we're, we're adults. Like, are you kidding me? I'm like, we can have sex, but we can't use the word condom. Like <laughs> it was just, mind blowing. Uh, yeah. Which that obviously happened before I got pregnant, but, but yeah, throughout the pregnancy, yeah, <laughs> maybe that's we, why <laughs> uh, yeah. maybe if we talked about condoms, we would, yeah, <laughs> but, uh, um, it wasn't until I actually had my child where things started to change. And the very odd thing about the pregnancy is that, you know, I, he was super supportive throughout the whole thing. But then when I was around six or seven months pregnant, we were sitting in his car in a parking lot. And he just says to me, you know, whatever you want to do, I'm on board with. Like, what do you mean? Like, you know, if you want to put him up for adoption, like, that's okay, too. I'll support you if that's what you want to do. And like, I'm completely blown away for like several months, like, we're, what do you mean? Like, we're keeping this baby. Like we're, we ha already have this plan. Like, I just, I don't know. I, I just kind of put him in his place there. You know, I'm like, I will, I will never, like, I'm not going to do that to my child. And, oh no. I was just saying, I was just saying, if you wanted to do that, if you, if it was going to be hard for you, I'm just supporting you. Like, why would you ever think I would have that thought in my head? I yeah, never once gonna... talked about it. Yeah, that's no, pretty I, random. I always I, talked about having him and being happy and, and you just, but it was for me. It doesn't make any sense. When I was eight months pregnant, I was still living with my best friend and his mother. And I was so happy there. I was beyond happy. Like it was my favorite place was to be around them. I love them very much. My boyfriend at the time and his mother said to me, you know, we have a bedroom here and you can come stay with us. Um, I'm, I mean, you have a choice. It's up to you, but she smokes and that's just not good for the baby. So, 
you know, uh, we do have a place for you here. And I'm like, okay, like, I want to stay there though. Like, I don't want to move in with you and your mom. Like, I don't want to be here, you know? And it's like, okay, well, it's your choice. But just so you know, smoking is really bad for the baby, but it's your choice. <laughs> like, so they don't really give me a choice, right? Because they manipulate me or guilt me into thinking I'm going to be a shitty mom if I choose to stay where I'm happy. That's yeah, exactly yeah. what happened. Oh yeah, I, that's I didn't very... realize. I didn't realize that at the time, but now I know because now I know better. <laughs> right. Well, we do better when we know better, but I think you have to go through things to definitely be able to look back and reflect on that. The, the moment I walked into that house, the moment that I moved my stuff in there, it was like a dark cloud around me all the time. I wanted to stay upstairs in the bedroom because I felt like, which I didn't know it at the time, that walking on eggshells feeling, that's what I felt all the time all the time. I felt like, I just felt super uncomfortable. I was out of place. I felt like a black sheep. I just, no matter what I did, I couldn't feel comfortable. And uh, yeah. What yeah. was going on that made you feel that way? His mom, his mom was very, uh, a very strict Catholic woman who judged the hell out of me, the hell out of me just by looking at me. Like you could just see it in her eyes and she'd be like, oh, hi, how are you today? But like the, the look, you know, I, this woman gives me nightmares. <laughs> like I, I have so many hypothetical arguments with her in my head. I swear one of these days I'm going to get courage. <laughs> like, <laughs> I swear I mean it. She just was very, uh, very like condescending. Um, uh, so it was after after our son was born. So I stayed in that house for about a year and every day I did laundry, did a couple loads of laundry. I folded the laundry. I swept the floors. I did the dishes, usually a couple loads throughout the day. And that's, I think I might've vacuumed and stuff upstairs, but that was pretty much what I did every day. And I didn't have a car. So my boyfriend, he was my only means of transportation and he was working half the time. So I was isolated in this house with just my child. And there were a couple times that his mom would get home about four o'clock. There were a couple times that I didn't do the dishes and she came home and she just like looked at the sink, looked at me, kind of rolled her eyes. Oh, what'd you guys do all day? You know? that kind of attitude. And, um, and another thing she would do, Oh, did you, did you take your son outside today? Did you take him out today? And I didn't go outside every single day, you know? And if I said no, like I said no a couple times, Oh, you know, it, it was just, so then I started getting insecure about that. Like, Oh, it's almost four o'clock. They're going to be home. I didn't take him outside yet. I got to hurry up and go outside. So when they ask me, I could say, yeah, yeah, I took him outside. You know, like I'm a good mom. That's how it made me feel. But I would have friends, uh, you know, call me up sometimes and they'd be like, hey, you know, do, do you and the baby you want to like come out and you want to do something? We'll come and pick you guys up. And I'm like looking at the clock and my chores aren't done yet. Like I can't, like I have to do all this stuff. And then I would miss out on those opportunities to hang out with my friends because I just felt like I was doing something wrong. You know, if I didn't get my shit done, I was doing something wrong. As a new mom, like who the heck has time <laughs> to clean and do dishes and keep the house perfect? And mm -hmm. like, first of all, your body's healing and your hormones are getting back to normal. And you have this new baby that's not on a schedule yet. And there's like so many factors there that it's, that's an insane amount of pressure that was put on you. Yep. And there's also four other people that lived in that house. So it was me, it was me earning my keep. I'm a people pleaser and I'm a good person. So I don't have to pay rent. I mean, my boyfriend didn't even pay rent at this time. So they're feeding me and they're keeping me warm. So this is my duty. This is my job to do this. But I sacrificed myself and in, in any good days that I could have like a life, you know, my own life just to earn my keep, just so that I could feel comfortable enough to stay there.
just so I could feel like I wasn't being judged. When you're talking about a situation like that, that's where a boundary would have been really good, right? Because Absolutely. being appreciative and helping around the house is a good thing. That's what good people do, right? Yeah. Um, you know, you're, you're an adult. You could be living on your own. You guys aren't ready to do that. You're living with them and you should show appreciation by not being a slob. And when you're able to help out, um, does that mean cleaning up after everybody all the time and feeling like you can't do anything for yourself ever? No, that there's a, there's a line there that should have not been crossed. So your boyfriend at the time, was he building you up or was he also trying to oh, chipping, chipping away at me little by little, this is how you hold him. This is how you burp him. This is how much milk you give him. You can't heat it up like this. You got to heat it like this. These aren't the diapers to use. These are the diapers to use. It's very, uh, yeah. So like basically nothing I did was right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what I, I always, I always put the wrong outfits on them, you know, and his, his mom was like that too. It was uh, wrong outfit. There's a wrong outfit. <laughs> oh yeah. You My, look back and go, what the hell? <laughs> he, he still, he still did that 19 years later. Um, you know, my, my two-year-old didn't sleep because I put, because I didn't put a onesie on her. Instead, I just put regular pajamas on her. So it's my fault. She didn't sleep. I mean, this is the kind of stuff. It's so I'm always right. I know everything. Yeah, I'm right about everything and mm -hmm. I love you, but I'm going to have to tell you how to do everything all the time yeah. because clearly you can't do it yourself, which, yeah. wow, I'm sure you felt really smart mm -hmm. having someone talk to you that way. Yeah. And, and then he would say, you're such a good mom. And then he would say all that stuff. And then he would say, you're such a good mom. And then he would do all that stuff again. And I'd call him out on it. And he would say, well, I tell you that you're a good mom all the time. <laughs> like, it's okay. like, well, you can, you can say something, but that doesn't mean you're making me feel that way. Yeah, how can I be a good mom when you tell me that every single thing I do is wrong? I mean, how does that, how do you expect me to feel? I so there's a red flag for people. He's doing this to you. Are you at a point where you're like, I don't want to be in this relationship. This isn't healthy. I, I didn't think that I wanted out of the relationship. I knew that I wanted out of that house. I didn't want to be in that house anymore because I, I felt like I couldn't even be myself. You know, like I was, I was dying in that house. It felt like my soul was being sucked away from me. Um, and like I had, I had to, cause I am naturally a silly, interesting person. And in that house, it was like, she was a strict Catholic. And so I had to be like, very proper. Like, that's how I felt like I had to act. And that's not who I am at all. The only thing that kept me sane was my best friend would come and visit me like once a week, he would come and visit me once a week. And, um, you know, we would just hang out and like watch a movie and, you know, hang out with my son and, and that was fine. Like nobody had a problem with it. And then one day he, well, he's gay. This is important to note. You'll hear why we were upstairs. Uh, my son was asleep. Eh, he was, he was almost one. He was asleep on the bed and my best friend and I, we were just sitting at the very edge of the bed and we were looking at the TV and we were just watching a movie and my ex's mom comes home from work. And she walks up the stairs and she walks by my bedroom and she sees the two of us sitting there. And she, she like gasps like that. And she runs out to her van and, and my best friend and I, we look out the window. We're like, what the hell is going on? Like, and she's in her van holding herself like this hyperventilating, rocking back and forth. And it turns out she's doing that because she thinks that I'm having an affair with my gay best friend in her home, you know, <laughs> I just, it was like, it was just mind blowing to me like that, that this is instead of communicating effectively, this is what you did. This is what you saw. This is how you took it. This is what you assumed. And the very next day, remember he was my only sanity. He was my, like my lifeline in this place. The very next day, she sat me down on the couch and she said, you know, I would really appreciate it if you started doing more around here. I would really appreciate it if you started vacuuming the furniture. 
I would appreciate it if you started taking the curtains down and washing them. Also, I don't want your best friend coming over here anymore because he makes me uncomfortable. The very next day is when I try to kill myself. So, <laughs> and at the time when it all happened, I'm crazy. Something's wrong with me. What is wrong with me? My childhood, am I allowed to swear? <laughs> my childhood messed me up. My childhood did this to me. My dad did this to me. My brother did this to me. Not even for a moment did I think that it was those people in that house because they were such good Catholic people. And it's, it's just, I can't even explain to you like the relief that I feel knowing what was happening. Now that I know what was going on and what was taken away from me and that I know where it came from. And yes, it was a combination of everything, you know, not, not, they're not entirely to blame, you know, like I had a lot of stuff before, obviously, but um, I was, I was losing my life. I was losing my life in that house every single day. And then because she was uncomfortable, which this is spiritual abuse, by the way, because her religion, I couldn't be on a bed with a man that wasn't her son sitting at the edge of a bed watching TV. This is her religion that believed me, like it convinced her that I was wrong to do that. That's what that was. So it made her uncomfortable. So I couldn't have my saving grace anymore. And what did I have? I didn't have a car. I no longer had a friend. I had to do more because what I was doing wasn't good enough. Nothing was good enough. I wasn't a good mom because they told me all the time that I wasn't doing things the right way. What did I have? You know, like, I'm not a good mom. So why stay alive for my son? Why would I stay alive for my son when it's the worst, when I'm the worst thing for him? So it wasn't, it wasn't a hard decision. It wasn't a hard decision. So I, um, yeah, I just, you know, I smashed glass on the ground and, and my boyfriend at the time was there and I just, and it was right in front of, I think this was my very first moment of reactive abuse. I really do. Cause I felt like, um, I, something, something triggered it. She said all those things to me. And then, and then the next day, his brother also lived there and he was, I was holding my child and he was telling this story and he was like holding a butter knife and he was very animated and he was swinging it around like this. And all I did was hold my child closer to me. It doesn't matter what's in your hand. It could have been a spoon or a marshmallow or, you know, it's just a natural reaction. Like, oh, there's an object flying around. So I held him closer to me and he started screaming at me. He flipped out and he's like, why would you do that? What, you think I'm going to hurt him? You think I'm going to hurt him? And I think he was like on something. Yeah. Um, which we didn't know until later, but it, that he, him doing that reminded me of my brother and what the stuff my brother would do to me. Cause it was like, he, it was pure terror. And, um, and that, that triggered that in me. The, so, so his mom did that stuff. The very next day, his brother yelled at me like that. And I remember running upstairs with my son and I called, I called my boyfriend who was at work. And I said, can you please come home? Can you please come home? I can't be here anymore. Can you please come home? I don't want to be here anymore. And he did, he came right there and he was like, what's wrong? Like what's happening? And as soon as I saw him, it was like everything everything like went black almost like I couldn't my emotions were so heightened that I just lost all control and I he was holding our son and I threw like I threw an object or something and it almost hit my baby like because I, I I wasn't there you know and then and then I just I took the glass and I smashed it on the ground and I just kept grabbing it and I was slicing my wrists my hands everything and I just I just remember there was blood everywhere and I ended up getting like 30 stitches and I was at the hospital for a week. And then um, everything changed after that. I, I only got my son like twice a week after that for like, the next, oh, sorry. No, it's okay. For like the next nine years of his life. 
it was like two or three days a week. Like I was the dad, I was the fun uncle. And is that, is that really emotional for you? Because like you look back and reflect on all this and now that you feel like you're in this different place, right? You're in this much stronger place now and you can't change that. No, you, you can't. You can't change those nine years. You can't get that time back. Um, but now that you're in this new state of mind of like strength and self-love to look back at that, it's like, damn it. Why didn't I have it in that moment? But you couldn't, you know that, right? Like, you know, that Absolutely. like, that's not who you were in that moment. And yeah. The reason things are okay now is because you went through that journey and you figured yourself out, right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And so these emotions that you're having are real, are so real because it's that like, damn it, why didn't I do this at that time? Mm -hmm. But it's like, you didn't have that toolbox. No. You had to build not. that toolbox over years and years. And it's also the everything in hindsight. You didn't know what was going to happen. No. You didn't know. You can't predict the future, you know? Right. And uh, And I did have those moments where I said, all of this could have been prevented if I just stayed with my best friend and his mom. It never would have happened. And I would have been happy. I would have been happy, but my two daughters wouldn't exist. And I would go through hell and back for them a million times. So maybe he walked down the, he, he walked down the stairs and I felt all those feelings that day because my intuition was telling me that it would create three beautiful human beings. That's the way that I try to look at it now. You can't change the bad and you don't have to devalue the bad and you don't have to pretend it doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, but it's important to try to find the silver linings and things. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes there isn't one. I mean, there are situations where there is no damn silver lining, right? You can't, that doesn't always work. But in a circumstance like this, yes, you can find the blessing that came yeah. out of the horrible parts. It, it definitely, that bad stuff, it built up strength and resilience in me that I had no idea I had yeah you know I had no idea and I this person that I am now that I'm that I'm like waking up to be I never in a million years would have thought she was in there ever you know so um I I honestly like <laughs> I wouldn't change it I wouldn't yeah. change things because like I I like what's happening like I like who I am now you know, yeah. and it's, I still get, a, there's so many triggers and everything, but, um, but the growth is just unbelievable. Like if you have the ability to self-reflect, sit in a room, meditate, you know, put music on, sit in the dark and just like, there's so much growth in that. There's just so much growth in that. If you could sit in your own feelings, do it, do not hide from them. Do not suppress them because that is, that is what keeps you there. So the breaking point for you is your five-year-old daughter and realizing that you've got to break down this barrier. So what did you do? Yeah, I was like looking into a window into the past, you know, and um, I had a conversation with him. Um, we were sitting in the kitchen and I was sitting right in front of a, a window on the, on the radiator. And I just, I don't remember what I said exactly, but it was like a 20 minute long conversation. And I'm like, crying and I'm letting all of this stuff come out of me. And I feel like the weight is like starting to come off my shoulders. Like I, I feel like I can finally breathe for the first time in years. I'm like, you know, this, we can't do this. This isn't going to happen anymore. And I gave him chance after chance to like with therapy, you know, there was one time where he said he was going to therapy for three months. And I got a letter in the mailbox from his therapist saying, we're terminating you for no, for too many, no calls, no shows. So he lied to me about actually going to therapy, like, cause that's what he did. You know, he, he put those little, what those little breadcrumbs out there of hope yeah, to keep, to keep you in. Um, but so I was just, you know, I brought all that up. I'm like, you've had so many opportunities to change and so many opportunities to get better and it's not happening. You're only getting worse. And our kids, I can't, I can't have our girls growing up like this too. I just can't. And, um, and I felt, I felt free, like in the, I can't even explain how this felt. The very moment that I finished talking, I was, I was sitting behind, I, don't know, I was sitting right in front of a window and he was standing across from me and he's the one that pointed it out. He said, Alicia, there's, there's a bird that just landed on the window behind you. And I'd like turn around and it's like, you know, 
this far away from me and it was like this little sparrow like clinging on to the screen and it started like singing at me the very moment i i like was like i'm done i'm like closing this chapter we need to be free and my dogs ran over to the window and they started barking at it like their snouts up against the window and it just stayed there singing at me like looking right at me and the look on my husband's face it was like it was like like he saw like a ghost or something it was very like surreal like it was um it was the first time that i really really felt like the universe or god or somebody was speaking to me and yeah. telling me like you just did it <laughs> you just did what you were supposed to do like this whole time you just did it and i'm like oh, yeah i did i did birdie i did it <laughs> it was my my best friend is very 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 christian and she's like you know that was god right i'm like really <laughs> that makes me feel special. So thank you. <laughs> and you know, that's the, that's that first part of self-healing, right? To yeah. stand up for yourself and be like, you know what? I'm sorry, but I can't do this anymore. And that is the hardest freaking part. If you can get over that hump, it's like, you can do anything moving forward. Like yeah. you can figure out the financial stress of a separation, the separating homes, the the, all that stuff is scary and it holds a lot of people in a relationship. You get to show them what building mental health looks like now. Yeah. And they, they get that influence in their life too. Otherwise they have a mother who's mentally beaten down and a father that's mentally abusive. And so what, what are the chances that those kids are ever going to have success? Absolutely. You know, my son wrote me a letter, um, for Christmas. And in that letter, he's never written me a letter in his life and he's not a very emotional person. And he wrote me this letter and inside of it, it said, I just want to let you know that you are one of the strongest people that I've ever known. And you inspire me to be a better person. So thank you for getting me out of a situation that I didn't realize was normal until now. You know, it was like, I did the right thing. You did the right thing. What advice would you give somebody that is in the shoes that you used to wear? Honestly, you know, it's so easy to lose yourself and it's so easy to feel crazy because they do that to you. They make you feel crazy, right? So something that I wish I started doing when I, when I got those feelings was recording. Honestly, like just writing things down and journaling and documenting and recording so that way you always have a record of what happened when they try to fool you or tell you that this didn't happen that way, that didn't happen this way, you're seeing things wrong. You can be like, hmm, let me go take a look at that, you know? And, yeah. and just, you're like validating yourself. Right. Because, Instead of questioning, did it yes. happen that way? I mean, yes. it was like two weeks ago or it was last night and mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, because losing yourself, like that was the hardest, that was the hardest thing for me is I really lost myself entirely and I felt like a different human being. And it was so hard to come back out of that. But your gut really doesn't lie. You know, you just ah. have to figure you have to figure out like, and this is my my issue now, what is the essence of my trauma and what is my intuition? How do I figure out what's intuition and how do I figure out what's trauma? And I didn't think I deserved better. I didn't yeah. think I deserved more. You know, I knew my kids deserved more, but I still was like, well, I don't deserve more. And how do you feel about that today? Uh, well, thanks to TikTok, you know, this awesome, huge community and support. Cause I was, I was like that person you're talking about that I was a stay at home mom. I had no income, no family. I had no way to get out which is why I stayed for so long because I didn't have resources. I didn't know what to do. And um, I just, I went, you know, I ended it and then I started making videos and I got, it's like a family that I never had. We say you are not alone because it's true. You're not. And, and when you're in that moment, you feel like you're alone and you feel like nobody understands what you're going through. But trust me when I say, yes, we do. So keep in mind that healing isn't linear. I mean, you know, there's steps you, you, you feel like you're on the top of the ladder, top of the world. Right. And then the next day you're like, I just fell three steps backwards, but you're still ahead. And that's what you hold on to. You really are, you know, you're still ahead. You're just going to keep bouncing back for a while. And then at some point it starts to level out, you know? Yeah. 
Um, Alicia, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's been awesome having you here and thank you for opening up and being so honest and sharing your story with us. Yeah, you're very welcome. I'm glad I could help.